Now, the other thing I want to share with you, and I haven't said anything about this because I know you've had a lot on your plate recently. I have um, almost finished another book, and that book is about the 1611 authorized King James Bible. And I thought I'd get it to the point where I feel it's pretty much done before saying anything to you. And see if it's something that you want to have a hand in in any way, shape, or form. And I wouldn't be surprised if you said, no, you're too busy, and that's fine. But I thought, I'm not going to say anything until I've actually got the manuscript pretty much in hand. I would be happy to send that over to you, but if you're overwhelmed, just say, nope. Reg, I will always make time for this type of stuff. As busy as I am, and, and I am extremely busy, I will always make time for this because this is my life's passion and conviction. It's an important subject. There's not much out there on this very subject. It's all based on the Holy Spirit. He's the one that gives you your PhD. Exactly. And I'm glad you said that because that's exactly yeah. what I was thinking this morning. If you go to uh, man's seminaries, whatever degree you have isn't worth anything. It's Steer really it. not. Yeah, it's just it's a stumbling block <laughs> is what it is. Yeah. And God talks about it. He takes the wise of heart with a snare. You have no wisdom other than what the Holy Spirit is teaching you on the Word of God. That's it. You can be the smartest guy on earth and you know nothing without the Holy Spirit. So That becomes very evident when you read some of these prefaces to these Bibles or you read yeah. the endorsements that some of these big shots make of RSV, ESV, NIV. I'm shocked at the stupidity that they write in these introductory notes or their endorsements. I've spent the last week and a half reading various endorsements from all these big shots and some of the most stupid and ignorant things I've heard said come out of these guys' mouths. I think they're so full of themselves, John, that they can't hear it anymore. To me, it just magnifies how God sends a delusion to those that are proud of heart. We can see how deluded these people are, and it's just a result of disbelief in the Word of God. Absolutely. That being said, we should probably get things rolling here. <laughs> Greetings all our listeners. John Dewar and I are talking about a file, a PDF, that we started into last time around. It's called AV1611 The True Bible-714 PDF. And we got through that up to about page, I don't know, 16 or so. And John gave us a history lesson. That history lesson took us from the crucifixion of Christ right on to the present. and. John presented the advancements in Christianity in the sense of the true spirit of Christianity and the documents that were written in the first century by the disciples, by the real believers, and then how those documents were passed along up through time, and we end up at the 1611 authorized King James Bible. And John took us through history, the whole history from the crucifixion of Christ and the counter-reformation efforts of the Vatican and other people to put a stop to this lineage of pure and true preserved documents. And of course, when it culminates at the 1611, the Vatican pulled out all the stops to try and prevent that Bible from being published. They understood how important that work was. And today, when we look back on it, we can see that because the 1611 authorized King James Bible, and I'm not talking about Blaney's KJV, the one that the Independent Fundamental Baptists used. I'm talking about the one that came off the press in 1611 that King James signed off on, that the translators signed off on. That's the one I'm talking about. After that Bible, there are no more Bibles of that lineage. Everything is corrupt. The Blaney Lineage is corrupt. You get the Cambridge and the Oxford editions that are corrupt. Not all of them, but they published corrupt editions. Dr. Paris published a corrupt edition, and the list goes on and on. We see there's a finality to that whole lineage at the authorized 1611 King James Bible. And that's why that Bible is so very important, because there is nothing like it in the world today. It's almost like the Holy Spirit closed the doors at that point and said, okay, here's your Bible. It's perfect. It's preserved. Now it's time for you to read it and sort it out. So, John, you took us through that whole lineage. 
But then we got up to a point in the file where you asked this question, why should we believe the authorized Bible of 1611? And you point us to the Holy Spirit. That is to say, without the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, there's no way you're going to know the difference. All Bibles are going to be more or less the same. I was thinking this would be a good place to pick up this file if it suits you, and then we can go from there. That sounds good. So that would be on page 16 of the PDF file that you referenced earlier in our conversation. Yes. And I quoted uh, three places in Scripture on that page. John chapter 15, verse 26 says, But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. And then 1 John chapter 2, verse 27, But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. And then finally, John chapter 10, verse 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And elsewhere in John chapter 10, it says, And a stranger's voice will they not hear. So it's all about the Holy Spirit teaching you so that you don't have to have a man to teach you. You can be taught directly by the Holy Spirit. And then when that process happens, fellowship with other Christians that are taught by the Holy Spirit and edify one another. What have you learned from the Holy Spirit? Edify, in other words, you know, edify, teach what the Holy Spirit has taught not what you've learned from the precepts of men. That's what's on the, the page 16 in my presentation, and then I go on and talk about how the Holy Ghost testifies in a number of places that there is a dross removal system built into the text of God's Word. What that means is when you get off of milk and onto solid food as a Christian, and you've got the Holy Spirit leading you around, teaching you spiritual language, giving testimonies from a variety of prophets, and a multitude of counselors, there is safety. Thy testimonies are my delights and my counselors. So what God is saying is, be edified by the Holy Spirit as you go around the Scripture, and you're going to learn the same testimonies written in spiritual mm -hmm. language, and natural people can't understand this. And then God is going to give you a testimony, and he's going to further explain it somewhere else in the Bible, in a number of places oftentimes so that you get a complete picture of the prophecy and also what's going on in the Bible. Mm -hmm. And if you do not have God's Word, you're not going to discern this. And you need God's Word, His pure Word, to discern things like the mark of the beast, the Antichrist, wormwood, basic things like this that are taught by the Holy Spirit, the identities of these things. And, you know, and I talk about when you become a Christian, God gives you a new tongue, you cannot be harmed by drinking deadly things. In other words, if the Vatican throws out their doctrine in front of you, it's not going to harm you if the Holy Spirit has taught you the precepts from the Word of God. You're not going to buy into all this nonsense that they're trying to sell. However, if you have a leavened lump or if the Scripture's been broken, if Satan has come in and subtly made some changes, a saved Christian can get a spirit of slumber and allow the Vatican to start pulling off some of this delusion that otherwise they could not, which is why they hate and detest the 1611 Bible so much. And I was taught that, as I mentioned earlier, as a, a young uh, boy, uh, just around the time of my confirmation, when I was around 11 years old as a Catholic, they told mm -hmm. me, we despise the 1611 Bible, they called it the King James Bible, King James, along with Martin Luther, are heretics that broke the church of the true church part. The King James Bible is corrupt. You mentioned something that I often think about. You contrasted milk with meat, and I find it interesting because you can ask the average Christian to tell you the difference between milk and meat and give you some examples. That is, what is something you've learned that is milk, and what is something you've learned that is meat? And they will look at you like you've got three heads. They don't know the difference. And you just said something that I think makes that clear. 
When you're learning milk, you're learning the precepts of men. Anybody can learn the doctrines, right? You can get a list and memorize the doctrines and recite a confession, and there you go. You've got milk. But the meat is the teaching of the Holy Spirit. And that's really where we started out talking about this whole subject was without the Holy Spirit teaching you, you're going to always be relegated to the milk department. And hearing that voice of the Holy Spirit teaching you, John, is so crucial because so many Christians don't hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. They may be saved and they may be indwelt by the Holy Spirit, but they've been so desensitized by reading corrupt Bibles and then listening to these guys who come out of the seminary who probably aren't even saved. And so the believer becomes desensitized in the sense that the Holy Spirit is saying, listen to me, listen to me, yet the believer is repeating the junk that comes out of the mouths of men. And that's milk. It doesn't matter how many PhDs the guy has. If he's not saved, he's going to teach you milk. And then as you pointed out in the first three verses that you read, you don't need a man to teach you. You've got the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is so clear about that, yet the church doesn't get that. They don't understand that. And I would also say our purpose here is not so much to teach people. Obviously, we want to teach people certain things, but it's to point them to the truth so that they then can learn to trust in the Holy Spirit. They've got the right word of God, the right preserved text, the right testimony, and then they don't need us. And that is my whole goal, John, is to make people independent. But I'll tell you something about people today. They want to be part of something. And when you are listening to the Holy Spirit, it's really you and God. That's it. It's not about what the world is doing. And that's so important, but most people aren't comfortable with that. They say, oh, well, what will people think of me? What will my family think of me? Um, What will my community think of me? Well, Jesus said, look, when you get to the pure testimony, you're going to be rejected and persecuted. And you're probably going to lose friends and family. That's going to happen. That's how you know you're on to the real thing. And as long as somebody has that fear in their heart of being ostracized or stigmatized or, oh, people will think I'm ignorant if I don't listen to the great scholars, well, then you have your master. You know who rules over you. And Jesus said this at one point to his disciples. He said, the Gentiles, the princes, rule over these people. And that's the case with most of the church today. But there's some verses here that I think you should talk to us about on page, um, I think it's page 18. I'll talk about those verses, and I'm going to just take a second to follow up on the point you just made, Reg. Okay. It says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. In other words, when we're born of the Spirit, you're born of the Spirit in a spiritual body, but you're a babe in Christ, okay? And you really don't have any skill, because in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 13, it says, For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. So, in other words, if you truly believe the testimony that you're reading, and you've repented and you get born again of the Spirit, you are a babe in Christ. In order to be skillful, you have to get off of milk and onto solid food. And as Reg said earlier, the Holy Spirit will lead you there. You have to follow him. You can't follow men. And that being said, on page uh, 18 of my presentation, Psalm 138, verse 2 says, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. God places a huge credence on his word. The scripture cannot be broken. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 35, it says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. It also says that in Mark 13 and Luke 21, and I've listed the verses there. Uh, God says that in a number of places. And as a Christian, we have to trust God, not men, that if we're going to live by every word according to his requirements, that he's going to provide us with that if we seek him out. It says in Psalm chapter 12, verse 6, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried. 
purified in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. If God didn't preserve his word, men would screw it up 100% mm-hmm. of the time. So God has to put that protection on his word so that we have something to believe in. The scripture cannot be broken. And then uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, also in Luke chapter 4. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That's what Jesus uh, said when he reproved Lucifer uh, during his time of temptation. And it's also shown in the Gospel of Luke, verse 4, chapter 4, as I mentioned. And then in conclusion, Proverbs chapter 30, verse 5, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Now notice that God says, trust in him, not in men. Mm-hmm. And that's a common theme throughout the Bible, is that it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in men. That's one of the central themes throughout Scripture. And, mm-hmm. you know, the world will pervert that, and they'll try to say, oh, no, God put pastors in place to mm-hmm. teach us and all that. Well, that's not necessarily in the Bible, um, in the 1611, that is. The pastor's role is to protect the Word of God and make sure that the congregation has the pure Word, and to also take an inventory of the spiritual gifts in the Church so that the edification can take place and so that people can worship in spirit and in truth, not so that they can grandstand and become these mega-pastors and and teach people all that they've learned in the seminary, which which really comes down to nothing uh, if it's not from the Holy Spirit. And then on the following slide, I talk about God's warnings about how people, men, will corrupt his word. I'm not going to read every single verse, but I've got citations from the book of Joel, Amos, 2 Corinthians, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Matthew, where God is admonishing true believers, telling them there's going to be famines, there's going to be devastating corruptions of his word. And it profits for nothing. It creates idolatry when people corrupt the Word of God. They create false prophets, and they're confounded. And if you're saved, you are not confounded according to what God says. So you don't want to be confounded. You want the pure Word of God, as I mentioned on the previous slide. And then, you know, when he gives us that truth, then he starts reproving the world. And when you get born again of the Spirit, the, the Holy Spirit, reproves the world of sin and starts teaching you things about the world's religion, Babylon, and who Babylon is. Babylon is a city and a country on seven hills or or mountains, as it says in in a number of places in the Bible, notably in Revelation chapter 11, verse 8, but also in Revelation chapter 17 and Revelation chapter 18, as well as many other chapters in the Bible where Babylon goes by different names, such as Tyrus or Nineveh, or Sodom, or Egypt. These are all cities and countries that are in rebellion against God, and they're spiritually symbolic of Babylon, and their leaders are Antichrist figures. And God reveals that in a number of places. You know, when he talks about the king of Tyrus in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 28, talking about the king of Babylon there, and he's using Tyrus as a name to describe Babylon. That's why the scholars get confused because they just see the king of Tyrus as a historical figure only. And while that may be true, they're not seeing what God is spiritually teaching the saints about the king of Tyrus. He's really describing Lucifer as the ultimate lesson there about how he is the anointed cherub. Not was, but is. He is currently the anointed cherub, and he deceives the entire world, the whole world. And so we need to know that in order to understand and discern what is going on in the world and who's leading the uh, rebellion against God. There was something you said that really stuck in my mind, and it's the idea that there are all these Bibles, and they're part of Mystery Babylon, they're part of that identity, but there are different Bibles for different purposes, and the devil has engineered those Bibles for various reasons. But the most subtle of them all, in my opinion, is the 1769, because it doesn't mess too much with the big words. 
And as you've pointed out in the past, scholars are not taught about the little words, the pronouns and things like that. They go to the seminary and they look at the big words. And so Satan being very clever has gone into this 1769 Bible, which purports to be the 1611 authorized King James Bible, and changed capitalizations, changed punctuations. And the average person does not understand how those things can corrupt the Bible, but they do. And there's many, many instances that you've pointed out where a pronoun is changed or a capital is changed or a comma is put somewhere and it completely changes the meaning of the scripture. And Jesus said that there would be a deception that would be so subtle that if it were possible, even the very elect would be deceived by it. And I can't help but think that these very subtle changes in the 1769 KJV are part of that subtle deception. And as I've been going through the Bible carefully and comparing things, I've found many other things where Blaney has inserted a comma and removed a title from the name of Jesus. For example, the woman who comes to Jesus to have the devil cast out of her child, she calls him Truth Lord, that is, gives him that title. And in the 1611, Truth is capitalized and Lord is capitalized and there's no comma in between the two. It's fascinating when you read that entire chapter and you realize that before she calls him Truth Lord, she worships him. And then he says to her afterward, You have a great faith. Your child is healed. He just says the word and it's done. The Blaney Bible puts a comma between truth and Lord, which forces you to refer the word truth back to a previous statement that Jesus made. And it removes the title, Truth Lord. And the Lord God, Christ Jesus, is the Lord of truth. And she acknowledges him as the Lord of truth. First she worships him, then she calls him Truth Lord. It's such a subtle distinction, John, but it's just a little comma. And this is the kind of stuff that you're going to find in the 1769 Blaney Bible. The NIV and all those RSV, ESV, and so on, they tend to deal with big words and then people waste their time comparing words in lexicons and arguing about words. And the Bible tells you not to squabble over such things. Those mainstream Bibles, and there's no shortage of them, they are so far off. But the subtle one, that's the 1769, and that's the one that Babylon has used to keep people from getting to the 1611, because the average person thinks they're reading the real 1611 Bible when they read the 1769. I think you said it very well, Reg, and if people are looking at the PDF file, I just give several examples of the discernment that is from the 1611 Bible, and I ask people to compare it to what they discern having read the 1769 Blaney Bible, and they themselves can determine what differences are there in the discernment. For example, in Job chapter 39, Jesus Christ is teaching us about the Church of Babylon, and then in the next chapter, he introduces the King of Babylon as Behemoth, And in the following chapter, he introduces the Antichrist, who is under the influence of the king of Babylon. So the prince of Babylon is in Job chapter 41. These are necessary to understand because in the Song of Solomon, we learn about the building of the abomination of desolation and how the world, Babylon, is drunk on the doctrine of Lucifer and how the Antichrist seduces the world. Then that leads us throughout the rest of the Bible to what the mark of the beast is, an oath that is proclaimed that a corruption or an idol or wormwood is the word of God. People are marked, and this is something that is taught over and over and over in Scripture. And I'm not going to get into all those doctrines, but I'm just going to contrast it with the conventional discernment that I've heard from, let's just say, the Blaney KJV users, is that behemoth is either a dinosaur or a hippopotamus. And Leviathan in Job 41 is a crocodile or a dinosaur. And the Song of Solomon is about Jesus Christ and the church. It's an allegory. And it's just about love of man and a woman together and the mark of the beast. Well, we don't 
don't have to worry about it because we're going to be raptured out of here and we're not going to take the mark and all that stuff. I just want people to know that's exactly how Rome wants you to think because that's exactly what Rome says in their apologetics. And people just don't understand who the enemy is. They come to you with smiling faces and flattery and compliments, but that's how the devil works is that he will look at your weaknesses, and this is coming from the Word of God, study you, and come at you as, if he needs to, as your friend, but he will puff you up and flatter you. Think about what happened to Solomon, the Queen of Sheba, told him, you know, he was even more amazing than what she had heard. His fame exceeded what she had heard, and then Hiram came in and helped him build the temple, and the next thing you know, he thinks he's something special, and he stopped listening to God, and the next thing you know, he was building high places to Moloch. That's what happened to Solomon. So if that can happen to Solomon, what can happen to the rest of us if we dismiss any precept in the pure text? That's something that every Christian should consider. Who are you following? Is it men or is it God? You mentioned Behemoth and what the book of Job is really teaching, and You don't even have to be a rocket scientist to figure this out, because if you just read those two chapters, 40 and 41, with a very technical mind, you will see that many characteristics of a person are attributed to Behemoth and to Leviathan. And so you have to view Behemoth as a person for those chapters to make sense. But people are very confused about the book of Job. And I can assure you, most people don't spend much time in the book of Job. And they spend less time in the Song of Solomon because the things they've been told by the scholars make it impossible to figure out what's going on. It's almost like, what am I going to read this for? I'm just learning about some kind of dinosaur or something like that. Whereas if you start reading it carefully and you let the Holy Spirit open your eyes up, you see that there are so many references in chapter 41 and chapter 40 to attributes of person. He is the king of the children of pride. Are you going to tell me that some dinosaur is the king of the children of pride? No, the witness throughout the scripture tells you that pride is a despicable attribute, something that God despises. And the children of pride are the rebellious unbelievers And do they have a king over them who is a sea monster or a dinosaur or a hippopotamus? No, they have a king over them who is the devil or his antichrist, but they do not have an animal ruling over them. There are many clues in there. And once people start reading the book of Job with a proper understanding and they realize this book is teaching us about the workings of Lucifer, It's teaching us so much more. Then that book becomes very interesting, and the same is true of the Song of Solomon. If it's just a love poem between Jesus and his church, most people are going to chalk it up to that, and they're not going to read that book. I'll tell you that for a fact. I don't think I really spent much time in the Song of Solomon or the book of Job in the past, because I went, I get the idea. One's about a picture of the church. Yeah, it's kind of boring, so I won't read that. And the other is about some guy going through trials and tribulations, and he comes out smiling at the end because he's faithful. Okay, I'll be faithful. Very good. Next thing. That's the general attitude that people have. If they don't have the right word of God, and they don't have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit leading them, that's eventually what they're going to do with those two books. And those books are relevant to what we need to know right now because they give prophecy that indicates that there's going to be an assembly of nations that will bring forth a book of peace that people will believe is the word of God because of lying signs and wonders that God allows the serpent to have in order to deceive the world. People need to know every word of God. And I'm going to close this conversation, Rich, with a final thought, and that is a scholar picks up an NIV Bible, and they truly believe it, and they believe it's the word of God. The NIV Bible is essentially telling them to lay their hands on a crocodile. So in order to obey God out of the NIV Bible, if they believe that Leviathan is a crocodile, then they are to go to their closest zoo that they live by and place their hands on the crocodile and remember the battle that's going to take place and do no more because they're not going to be able to do anything else after that battle takes place. That's how silly these modern Bibles are. They don't understand any spiritual meaning because they have mouths and they don't speak. And 
flee from idolatry, even if somebody has a Blaney Bible and is bought into the papal doctrine that Leviathan is a crocodile, they may think the same thing, that is God really telling me to lay hands on a crocodile? And if I truly believe God, let me try to do that. God confounds people who are wise of heart. You have to trust the Holy Spirit. And the whole presentation, the whole reason Reg and I are talking right now is not for you to believe us, but rather believe God. Go and get the 1611 Bible if you haven't received it already and believe on it and trust the Holy Spirit to lead you to all truth. And I'm going to close my commentary there. And the next time we talk, we can pick up with some of the cast of characters that are proclaiming themselves to be these great Christian scholars, but in fact are just the opposite. Okay, John, that sounds excellent. Folks, go to Seaville Bible Baptist, that's the letters C-V-I-L-L-E, BibleBaptist.com, and click on John's link there. It says Adult Education, and you'll be able to find this file and many others, and I suggest you download those files. We've gone through a couple of files now, so you'll find both of those files there, and there's lots of other material, terrific material. So my recommendation is that you do that. And John, I'm going to let you go. I know you've got probably a lineup at your door, so let's leave it at that, and I look forward to talking to you next week. Hey, Reg, God bless, and we'll talk then. 